The basic laws of health. Incorporate those eight laws. They sound simple. They sound simple. You may have heard it your whole life, but I tell you, those eight laws will make the difference of whether you live long or you live short. The things that you can grow in your garden, that you can put in your kitchen, that's where your medicine cabinet should be. Welcome back to Old Mountain Remedies. Today we're going to look at a systematic approach on how to develop an effective lifestyle plan. You know, there's so many plans out there, this plan, that plan, this diet, whatever. We, today we'd like to look at how can we do that effectively, but do it naturally. Let's take a look. As we look at the problems today, are we dealing with obesity, heart disease, strokes, cancer, thyroid problems, gout, diabetes, the list goes on and on as I work with people. What's the impact? Not only is there an impact on the person who has that chronic disease, but what's the impact on society? Let's look. The 11 most costliest disease in the United States. Num number 11, AIDS or HIV, $24 billion a year. Uh, hyperlipidemia is $34.5 billion a year. Kidney disease, renal issues, $38.1 billion. <clears throat> Mental disorders, 57.5 billion. Arthritis, 74.4 billion. COPD or asthma is 79.6 billion. It's interesting that they have the two together. They uh, are separated, COPD and asthma, because you're going to see over the next probably year asthma fully fall out of COPD, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease. Obesity, $147 billion. Cancer, $157 billion. Dementia, this is interesting, the third most costly, dementia, $159 billion. Diabetes, $176 billion. And the big guy, $193.4 billion, heart disease. If you look at all that, $1 trillion, $140 billion. $500 million a year in the United States to treat those 11 diagnoses. Now I have the, the 10 most deadly on the left. I have the amount of people that die each year. And then just to kind of make it to where we can kind of get a little reality of how many people are dying, the number on the right would be how many 747s first, second, third class type 747s, but be crashing each year. I think that is what would get people's attention if we lost that many 747s. So let's look. Chronic liver disease and cirrhosis, 36,427 people die each year. That's 87.6 Boeing 747s crashing each year. If one Air Boeing 747 crashed, that would get folks' attention. Septi uh, sept septicemia, 38,156. Chronic kidney diseases, 47,112. Influenza and pneumonia, 56,979. Diabetes, 75,578. Alzheimer's disease, 84,767. Strokes. 128,978. Chronic lung disease, 149,205. Number two, cancer, 584,881. And the big killer, heart disease, which is 611,105. That is equivalent to 1,469 Boeing 747s crashing each year just in heart disease alone. And it's interesting, do you, do you know what the number one killer of firefighters is each year? It's not burning up in a fire. 
It's not smoke inhalation. It's heart disease. It's actually heart attacks is what kills firefighters the most. But take a look at this. We're losing, of these 10 deadliest diseases, we're losing 1,813,188 people. That's equivalent to 4,358.6 Boeing 747 crashes a year. Amazing. And what's interesting is the majority of these are preventable. They're preventable just by lifestyle. Amazing. As I work with people and, I, and they come in and, and they have challenges and I say, I'd like to help you. Here's what you need to do. No, I just want a pill. I want a healthy pill, but I don't want to change my lifestyle. It takes lifestyle. If I had a, a, as I've mentioned before, a piece of a, a, a sandpaper and I rubbed my arm and it started bleeding and you put something on there and I kept rubbing it then and kept coming back and fixing it and I kept rubbing it, it's not going to heal until I quit rubbing it with sandpaper. The same thing's true with lifestyle. So what are the two most, or the two top root causes? It's appetite and being sedentary. That is the two major causes as we look at these chronic diseases, what's the major cause? To fix a problem, you have to get to the root cause. Your wife's saying that she drives her car down the road, it pulls to the right. And you notice that her front tires are wearing out. And you say, no problem, I'll take it down to Terry and he'll put a new set of tires on there. Terry puts a new set of tires on there and 10,000 miles down the road, you notice the tires are wearing again. Take it back down to Terry, your tire guy, and Terry goes, no problems, I got tires, I'll put new tires on there. And he puts tires on there again. And 10,000 miles down the road, your tires are wore out again. And Terry goes, no problem, I got tires. And he puts more tires on there. But what did Terry not do? He didn't fix the front end alignment. You got to fix the problem. And that's what happens in healthcare is we're managing signs and symptoms and we're not getting to root cause. And that's what we'd like to look at today. So what do we do? What's the prescription? Get up and change your lifestyle. When we work in healthcare, we're used to looking at API, assess, plan, implement, and evaluate. Well, we added then MAPI. What's the mission? If you have a patient with problems, you want to assess the problem. You then make a plan for to taking care of that patient. Then you implement that plan, and then you evaluate that plan. Is it working? Well, I'd like to use that same tool as we develop a, an effective lifestyle program this, uh, today. But I'd like to look at adding mission to that, because that's really what drives corporate America, it should drive what we do on a daily basis. So let's take a look. So if the root cause, number one, is appetite, is there anything in the Bible that talks about that? Well, yes, it does. Let's go back. Whether therefore ye eat or drink or whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. So that means when I sit down at the dinner table and what I put in my mouth or when I'm out and I'm grabbing something to drink, or when I'm out driving and I pull into a restaurant and I look for something to eat, and I put that in my mouth, whether therefore ye eat or drink, do it to the glory of God. Does it matter what we eat? Absolutely it does, and we'll talk about that in just a little bit. Then we look at 1 Corinthians 6, 19 and 20. What? Know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost which is in you, which ye have of God, and ye are not your own. I work with people and I tell them, you know, you need to quit smoking. I had a young lady just yesterday. She uh, contacted me and she says, Mom only has four weeks to live. Is there anything we can do? Mom has lung cancer, but mom refuses to stop smoking. But she's her own person. She can smoke if she wants to. 
Or I can do drugs if I want to. It's my body. I can do whatever I want to. Or I can drink moonshine if I want to. This is my body. It's not yours. But what does it say here? What know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost which is in you, which ye have of God, and ye are not your own? For ye are bought with a price. Therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. Now, you are bought with a price. What is that price? That's Christ's death. Christ bought us back when He died. We don't belong to ourselves. We can't make that decision, I can do whatever I want to. I'm independent. No. Now let's go back and, and it gets even more serious. Again, know ye not that ye are the temple of God, and that the Spirit of God dwelleth in you? If any man defile the temple of God, him shall God destroy. For the temple of God is holy, which temple ye are. And I believe that God allows diseases to come. And that's how you're destroyed. And so we have a choice. The Bible is full of if-then if, statements. It reminds me of when I was in college and I took a computer course, computer language called basic language, and we wrote it in if-then statements. If-then, if-then. If you obey, here's the consequences. <clears throat> the Bible's full of it. David, if-then. Moses, if-then. Well, for our lifestyle, what we put in our mouth, what we drink, is an if-then statement. The brain is the organ and instrument of the mind and controls the whole body. In order for the other parts of the system to be healthy, the brain must be healthy. In order for the brain to be healthy, the, must, the blood must be pure. If by correct habits of eating and drinking, the blood is kept pure, the brain will be properly nourished. So what did it just tell us here? Before you treat the body, we've got to treat the brain. But before we treat the brain, we've got to treat the blood. How do we treat the blood? What's it say? If by correct habits of eating and drinking. Those two keep coming up. There must be something to what we eat and what we drink. Whether therefore ye eat or drink or whatever ye do, do all to the glory of God. So let's look. Let's make an assessment. You've got to have a mission. And, and I encourage you to look at what your personal mission is. And we'll, look, we'll do that a little more. But let's do a health history first. So first we're going to look and we're going to assess what's the person's age, what's your age, What's your occupation? Now, does occupation, does that have a, a, a factor? Absolutely. If you are a, um, a beautician, do you deal with a lot of things that you may be breathing? Yes. Or do you work at a nail salon where you're breathing all those chemicals all day long? There's a reason those nail folks have masks on. Do you work in the agriculture business where you're out there and you're putting chemicals do you work in a plant? I work with people that come in to see me and they work in plants that there's chemicals that they're dealing with. I had a man come in one time. He was only in his early 50s. I think he was 52 or 53 years old. He looked like he was in his 80s. And he worked at a plant that made the chemical that goes into um, transformers, PCBs. And it just significantly aged this man. So occupation can have an impact on your health. Or what's your work schedule? Do you work third shift? Do you work swing shift? Even worse. You want to list your health concerns. What are your health concerns? Uh, is it diabetes? Is it uh, tactocardia? Is it uh, your, heart, your pulse going, uh, beating too fast? Do you have uh, pain from arthritis or hip pain or knee pain? Or you want to list all of your health problems. You want to identify your bowel movements. It was interesting when I was 
working at a center right outside of D.C. and these highfalutin ladies would come out of New York City and they would sit down and I'd say, how many bowel movements did you have yesterday? And they'd go, well, it's important. Are you having bowel movements? And what's the consistency of those bowel movements? Do you have pain? What's the location of the pain? And you want to document the location. Uh, in my hands, it's a zero to 10. My knee, zero to 10. My hip, zero to 10. My back, zero to 10. Headaches, zero to 10. Because we want a baseline on what your pain level is. And then we want to look at stress. What's your stress level? Zero to 10. This is some history questions that you want to take a look at. Also depression, do you have challenges with depression? Zero to 10. And males or females, do you have hormone issues? We're seeing more and more hormone problems today, and there's reasons for that. We'll talk about that later. But whether it's a male having testosterone issues, he has no energy, or if it's a lady who's having all kinds of issues from, her, her, uh, her, from menopause to whatever with hormone issues, is there issues there with hormones? Now we're going to look at lifestyle history. Nutrition, what do you eat for breakfast? Uh, when do you eat it? What time? What time of the day do you eat breakfast? If it's consistent, write that down. Or if you uh, may eat it, you may not eat it. Uh, what time those may be. And then what do you eat for breakfast? What's the range of things that you may eat for breakfast? Is it Hardee's? Is it a coffee? Or are you sitting down eating a healthy breakfast? And then you want to look at dinner. Dinner's that noon meal. And what, uh, what time are you eating it? What do you eat it? What do you eat? Um, and so you want to write those down also. And then supper. When do you eat supper? And what do you normally eat? And then do you eat between meals? You want to write that down. And I hope y'all are writing all this down because this is what you're going to use to develop that systematic plan that we're talking about here. Do you eat between meals? And if so, what time do you eat between meals? And what do you eat between meals? Are there any foods that you are allergic to? You want to write those down. Do you seem that you have problems when you may eat wheat issues, uh, foods, or other foods? Do you have allergies to those? And now you want to look at exercise. Can you describe your exercise program? What type of exercise? What time are you exercising? And what's the duration of your exercise? A lot of folks will say, oh, I walk at work. I used to have, my nurses used to say, well, I push the med cart. No, that's not exercise. We want good, a, 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 a systematic exercise program. What is your exercise program? If you don't have one, that's fine. Just write no consistent program. Water. How much water do you drink each day? If it's a range, identify that. Do you drink soft drinks? And if so, how many? How often? Do you drink milk? If so, how often? How much? Do you drink tea? Now some people, there's herbal teas and then there's teas like sweet tea. I'm from the south. And folks love their sweet tea down south. And they drink a lot of sweet tea. I've got a fellow in a fire department that would drink enough sweet tea a day that had two cups of sugar in that sweet tea. How about coffee? Do you drink coffee? If so, how much and how often? So you want to document what you're drinking each day. And if it's a caffeinated drink, identify it's caffeine in it. Now in this lifestyle survey that we're doing, you want to look at how much sunshine do you get each day? Are you clothed? Is it just your face? Is it just your hands? Are you getting your arms? In the wintertime it's a lot more difficult where it gets cold. And then you want to look at temperance. Temperance is making the right decisions, making the right choices. And we want to look at do you use tobacco? If so, uh, how much? How often do you use uh, alcohol? And if you use alcohol, if so, how often, how much? Do you use illicit drugs? If so, how, how often and how much? Do you watch television? If so, how often, how much? 
It's amazing how much time, and we'll look at that, how much time is spent watching television. Or how about, um, do you use the computer? If so, how much? How often? Pure fresh air. Some parts of the world, some parts of the country, there's more pure air, but some places there's a lot of pollution. Another reason that we should move out of the city and move into the country, up in the mountains, up, out in an area that we don't have to deal with the challenges of the city. Pollution is one reason that we should be out of the city. And rest. What time do you go to bed? What's the range? People I sit down with, I ask them, what time do you go to bed? It could be 11 o'clock, it could be 3 o'clock, 4 o'clock in the morning. I don't have any set time. Well, if that's the case, 11 to 4. What time do you go to sleep? <clears throat> now, just because you went to bed does not mean you're getting to sleep. And some people may lay there for three hours trying to fall asleep. What time do you get up? What's the average hours of sleep that you get each night? What's the quality of sleep? Is it good or is it poor? If it's poor, why is it? Is it because you're a fella and you're having prostate issues and you have to get up three, four times a night to go to the bathroom? Or is it because the kids, uh, you know, you have a young baby? Is it because you're in the city and you live next to the fire station and every time that fire truck goes out on a medical call or a fire call, it wakes you up? Why are you having poor sleep? Is it because you have pain? Your back hurts, your neck hurts. The other is trusting in God. Do you go to church? Do you spend time in personal study with God each day? Or sometimes I ask, does a person believe in God? And there's people I work with say, I don't believe in God. But just if you do, whatever the situation is. Again, as we look, assessing personally, why do I have health challenges? As you look at yourself, why do you have health issues? What are the causes? You want to take a look at that. <clears throat> now, you want to do a three-day diary. We, would, we do a three-day diary when we work with folks who are wanting to stop an addiction, whether it's tobacco, whether it's alcohol, whether it's drugs, and they will write down every time that they use them uh, what the time is, where they are, who they're with. And they do that for three days so that we can look, we can trend. Well, you want to do that for when you eat. <clears throat> Every, for three days, identify what time you eat, where you are, what you're eating, who you're with. I don't care if you just stop by the M&M machine, grab some M&Ms and, and eat it, or if you go by and grab some chips. Every time for three days, write down Every time you eat something, what time is it? What you're eating? What's the, what's the occasion? Is it, uh, is it a meal or is it just grabbing something to eat and who you're with? So here's an example. The time, 7 o'clock in the morning, what you're doing, you're eating breakfast. What's the food? Breakfast food. Who you're with? Family. And why? It's meal time. That's a pretty simple one. But then at 10 o'clock you have break. What did you eat? You had a Snickers bar and a Dr. Pepper. You're with Sally. Why? It's just a habit. I do that every morning at break time. <clears throat> and then you want to, as you do this for the three days, you then want to identify trends. Time, what foods you're eating, who you're with, and why you're eating other foods than meals are their triggers. Are there triggers for why you're doing this? It might be when you drive by the Dairy Queen. It's just Dairy Queen's a trigger for you. It might be when you uh, walk by a, um, a candy machine. It's a trigger for you. So you want to identify what those are. Then you want to write the specific identified trends down. It could be break time's a trigger, riding in the car's a trigger, uh, um, certain stressors. It could be when, uh, when I'm stressed when this situation has, or when I get stressed like this, I just eat. Or it could be when I'm watching television. It could be when I'm on the telephone. Whatever those uh, specific trends are, you want to identify those. <clears throat> now we're going to get into the plan. We've assessed. We're now making a plan on API. 
His most effective temptation today, listen to this guys, this is amazing. His, his most effective temptation today, Satan comes to man as he came to Christ with his overpowering temptations to indulge appetite. Satan is constantly on the alert to bring the race fully under his control. His strongest hold on man is through the appetite. And this he seeks to stimulate in every possible way. Does he do that well? <laughs> Absolutely. And it's getting worse and worse. When I grew up as a boy in the mountains of East Tennessee, there wasn't a lot to stimulate you. But today, it's everywhere. Their taste, their appetite is their God. And when the ax is laid at the root of the tree and those who have indulged their depraved appetites at the expense of health are touched, their sin pointed out, their idols shown them, they do not wish to be convinced. And although God's voice should speak to them directly to put away those health-destroying indulgences, some would still cling to the hurtful things which they love. They seem joined to their idols. Now, what's the idol? Appetite. Now, this is scary, y'all. This is amazing. And God will soon say to His angels, let them alone. So, as we are tempted... As Satan puts those temptations of whatever it may be on your list, God allows us to make decisions. And there comes to a point that God said, just let them alone. That's what they want to do. I had a man come into me, a very smart man. He came in and he has diabetes. And he came in and he said, Walt, I'm looking for something healthier to address my diabetes to manage it. I said, why don't you just reverse it. I know the fellow, we're friends. Why don't you just reverse it? He says, I can't. I said, why can't you? He said, because I don't want to change the way I eat. Just period. Years ago, I had a patient. He was a renal patient, a dialysis patient. And this gentleman liked fried chicken, loved fried chicken. And his wife would get him fried chicken. And so I told his nephrologist, Dr. Gordino, I said, J.J., I said, Mr. So-and-so, he's, he's, he won't quit eating fried chicken. As you all know, if you're a renal patient, you don't eat fried chicken if you're having problems with renal issues, with dialysis. And his physician said, you know, Walt, it's his choice. Now, if he, if he continues to eat the fried chicken, he's going to live probably not even a month. But if he stops eating the chicken, he can live a good bit longer. So I went and told this patient, I said, Mr. So-and-so, I uh, talked to Dr. Gordino, and here's the situation. What do you want to do? The man looked at his wife. She was there. Looked back at me. He says, I love my fried chicken. I'd rather die happy. And just as Dr. Gordino said, the man died he didn't even make a month. We, God gives us that ability to choose. And here it tells us, they seem joined to their idols, idols being taste and appetite, and God will soon say to His angels, just let them alone. Scary. Whether therefore ye eat or drink, or whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. And we keep you know, God is very clear. He tells us what to do. Well, are you going to choose what you eat and drink? You'll have this outcome. If you choose this, you'll have this outcome. So, you want to develop a plan of action for each trend in your three-day personal diary based on your mission. What is your mission? Do you want to be healthy? Do you want to... Um, do you want to get rid of the cardiovascular disease? Do you want to reverse the type 2 diabetes? Do you want to lose X amount of weight? Do you want whatever it may be? Do you want to improve the fibromyalgia? Whatever it is, that's your mission there. Based on your mission, you've got to develop a plan. 
for bre to, at break time to, to fix break time so you're not tempted to eat with Sally the, the Snickers and drink the Dr. Pepper. How do you do that? I'll eat a good nutritional breakfast uh, and therefore I'm not as hungry when it comes to 10 o'clock for break time. And instead of sitting in there with, uh, with Sally, I'm going to go for a walk in the sunshine, fresh air, drink some water instead of sitting in the break room with Sally. Now, if Sally wants to go with you, that's great. But don't let Sally bring her donut and tempt you to eat the donut. So at break time, what are you doing? You're proactively, you're choosing a healthy breakfast so that you won't be as hungry. And then you're drinking some water that's kind of filling you up. You need water anyway. The fresh air, the sunshine, the exercise, that's, you're getting some extra uh, laws there also. What about tonight when you get home? Are you going to sit there and, and, uh, and watch TV and as those commercials come on and say, oh, would you like this potato chip? Oh, would you like to drink this Mountain Dew? Well, what do you do? Do some reading. Drink some warm, calming herbal tea and go to bed by 9 o'clock. Don't stay up. Television is a tool I personally believe that Satan uses for many avenues and appetite is one of them. The next thing on your plan is you want to choose a partner. One of the reasons that they found that um, uh, Weight Watchers is so successful is they have partners and they meet routinely. A partner is very important. If a person uh, it comes to me and they're wanting to stop smoking, I encourage them to get a partner because if they want, they get that hankering for that cigarette, all they need to do is five minutes. Research shows if they'll not smoke for five minutes, they'll overcome that desire for that cigarette. So I encourage them to have a partner. They call up that partner and talk to them. Help me out here, Sally. Um, well, maybe Sally's not the good person for this one. Uh, maybe Susie, help me out here. I really have a hankering for a donut. Well, let's talk about something. And you talk about something else and other than food, and Susie gets your mind off of it and helps you out. They're like a coach. They help you. They're your support partner. And that may, it may be a spouse. It may be a parent. It may be a sibling, a best friend. It may be a co-worker. But choose a partner to help you in this program. You want to choose a start date. You want to choose one that is reachable and obtainable. You want to stay away from holidays, family vacations, and pre-planned events. One day I was, we just started a, a, um, a stop smoking program and the hardest place I've ever done stop smoking is right outside of Winston-Salem, North Carolina. Well, that's tough. RJR is there. And we started the program and I told them that we did an information uh, night and then the next day when they left that night, they were supposed to just no more smoking. And I said, is everybody willing to not smoke starting at, when you leave here and, and start now? And one fellow raised his hand and he said, uh, no. He says, I can't. Now this was a Sunday night. He says, but I'll start Thursday morning. I said, why? He said, my mother-in-law's coming to town. There ain't no way I can stop smoking. But she leaves Thursday morning and I'll quit then. Well, everybody else quit that night. He kept smoking. Thursday morning he quit and he was successful. He put down his cigarettes. But he knew that he would fail because of the stressors that were at the house. If you're planning on starting a new lifestyle program, and you're getting ready to go on a family vacation. May not be the best time. Or you're planning to start a lifestyle program and it's the week before Thanksgiving or the week before Christmas. Don't, I don't even try to do programs during this. Don't set yourself up to fail. Pick a good date. So we have a mission. We have developed an action plan for each trend in our three-day personal diet diary. Again, I want to be very clear here. Each of those items that you've, uh, that you've identified that you're eating 
between meals or that you're not eating like you should, you want to develop a specific plan. Example, many people do not eat breakfast, or if they do, they eat a donut, or they eat a biscuit, or a croissant. You want a good healthy meal. So in your plan is specifically what you're going to do to make sure that you have a full healthy meal. And then if you're eating in between meals, between then and, and your noon meal, you've identified them. What are you going to do so that you don't eat? I used to have an M&M machine in my office. A patient gave it to me. And I made sure it was those big M&Ms. You know the ones with the nuts in them? And I'd go through a three pound bag. It's pretty fast. And, and I, I convinced myself that I had it if people came in, staff came in, or, or people came in to see me, it was something they could get and, and make things a little easy, whatever. And, um, but I made sure that thing worked. I made sure it worked every time I went out the door. I made sure it worked when I came back into my office. And even I'd make sure, even when I was doing paperwork, I'd get up and make sure that little machine was working well. When Mary Lou decided I need to lose some weight, I was 200 and some pounds, um, that machine disappeared. She took that machine. I haven't seen it yet, and that's been probably 17 years ago. If you want to quit smoking, do you leave cigarettes in the house? No, you get rid of them. You get rid of the ashtrays, you get rid of the lighters, you get rid of all the paraphernalia, you get rid of the tobacco. If you want to quit drinking, do you still leave the whiskey in the, in the cabinet? No, you get rid of it. So you've got to make a, a plan that's going to make you successful. We've chosen a support partner. We've set a start date, which is reasonable and obtainable. So those have already happened. The next step is to start our program. It's step one, it's a three day to 10 day, depending on what you want to do. It's a detox program. If you can do 10 days, it's, it's, you'll have better outcomes. But if you just take a look at it and see what you can do, anywhere between three and 10 days, you want to do a detox. First, you want to go to bed by nine o'clock at night. That's when the day starts, when it gets dark. You want two glasses of warm uh, lemon water first thing in the morning. You want to detox your mind with 30 minutes each morning, at least, in Scripture and prayer. Do we need to detox our mind? Absolutely. So we're doing a detox. We're getting rid of all those toxins that's in our body, both physically and mentally. And then I encourage you to do a juice detox. It is the best thing that I've ever found. Here's why. When a person eats a meal, they... It takes as much vital force as it does to go down to the gym and work out. So if you eat three meals a day, it's like going down to the gym three times a day. When you drink a juice that is, has the fiber out, it's going to be in your blood within 15 minutes. It's kind of like Hyperal. When we would put Hyperal into a patient, we'd go into a central line and we'd feed them with Hyperal right into their blood. Well, juicing is in your blood within 15 minutes of when you drink it, if there's no other food in your stomach. The other thing is that by juicing, you're not putting bad stuff in. It's only the juice going in. And you're getting copious amounts of good stuff in when you're drinking the juice. And I encourage vegetable juice. If you want to use a little fruit, apple with it or whatever, that's okay. But mostly vegetables because there's so much nutrition in it and not as much sugar, and we want to really detox you. We do 16 ounces of vegetable juice for breakfast, for dinner, and for supper. And if you want to watch a good documentary on this, you can, there's a movie called Fat, Sick, and Nearly Dead. And you can watch it, whether you're watching it online, Netflix, whatever it is, you can go to www.fatsickandnearlydead.com. It's an Australian man, man who decided to make a lifestyle change, and he did a documentary on juicing. It's a very good program. So you want the first three to 10 days in your new lifestyle plan, you want to juice. Now, this man juiced for two months. 
If you want to do that, you can do that. But if you do juice for long term, you need to make sure you have adequate sodium. There's a minority of folks that may have some challenges there, so you want to make sure you either have a lot of celery there or you have a little, maybe a teaspoon to two teaspoons of salt in your water each day to make sure there's no sodium issues. It's usually not a problem, but it's just a safety. You want to detox your body. At bedtime, you're going, uh, again, you're going to bed at night, you're drinking two glasses of warm water uh, with lemon in it, you're, uh, you are um, having your worship and prayer each morning for 30 minutes, you're juicing, and then you want to do a liver gallbladder detox. And you want to exercise outdoors in the fresh air. When you, if you want to see the liver uh, detox, you can go to, uh, there's a lot of programs out there, but you want to do a good liver and gallbladder detox. And also do, you can also do a, um, uh, a colon cleanse at the same time. And, and do, come to our kitchen medicine class and, uh, and you can see how to do that. Exercise, it's best if it's outdoors in the fresh air and sunshine. Uh, it's, it's amazing the difference in, in outcomes when a person exercises outside in fresh air versus inside in the stale air. Walking, rebounding, that's the mini trampoline, cycling, swimming. Uh, you can also, when you're doing it, you want some strength also. You can put some water bottles in your hand or some uh, bean cans in your hand when you're walking or whatever. But exercise is important. And when you exercise, if you don't ever exercise, then don't try to do a, a 10 mile walk because you're gonna hurt the next day or maybe even that night. And so you wanna start slow and gradually build. Water, you wanna make sure you're drinking plenty of water. How much water do I need? If you're less than 128 pounds, you need four bottles, water bottles a day, and so that's a, a half a gallon. If you're over 129 pounds, you need your body weight divided by two in ounces. Now that's just to get started. That's if you're sitting on the couch. But if you're out exercising, if you're out sweating, then you're gonna need even more. Now we're going to step two. So we've done step one, which was three to 10 days. Step two, is this a continuing a, a, a progressive detox program? This is three to seven days. Again, going to bed by nine o'clock, having your two glasses of warm lemon water in the morning, uh, having your morning worship and prayer with God, detoxing your mind. Um, and then you want to eat just raw. When a person juices, they don't want to put cooked food right onto their stomach. And so you want a little time there of eating raw. People come into me and they'll say, Walt, I want your best detox pill. Well, my best detox program is what I'm telling you right here. It works better than any pill. It's, it works your whole body instead of just down through your digestive and maybe it affect the liver and the gallbladder a little bit, but this will do the whole body the mind and, and, and everything. So you want to eat raw. So for breakfast, uh, some raw fruit. For dinner, some raw veggies, but no dressing. Supper, uh, you can fast or drink some vegetable juice. You want to incorporate cilantro, parsley, chia seeds, flax seeds, aloe vera, sea vegetables, etc. <clears throat> The next item is you want to do your continuing. If you did the step one in just three days you, and you haven't finished your gallbladder cleanse, then you want to continue that liver gallbladder cleanse through this process also. Exercise, again, outdoor, fresh air, sunshine, and your water. Step three, this is five or more days. We're progressively detoxing. Again, you're going to bed by nine o'clock. You're drinking your two glasses of warm lemon water each morning. You're spending your time at least 30 minutes in, in, in prayer and, and study uh, with God. And then you're doing the Duke diet. The Duke diet was started in 1934 
by Dr. Kempner. And it's been going for 82 years. Amazing, amazing program. Uh, very simple, but we use it in our detox program. For breakfast, you get one cup of brown rice with three servings of fruit. Now you can go to Duke and do this, but they'll charge you $6,400 to eat this diet. Plus you have to have a motel room and you have to have a gym fee. I encourage you just to do it in your own house. For breakfast, one cup of brown rice that's cooked with three servings of fruit. For dinner, one cup of brown rice with a salad that's no dressing, no salt, no cheese, no meat. Just the dressing. Now, I mean just the salad, no dressing. You can squeeze some lemon on it, um, but uh, you don't want anything else on that salad. For supper, you can either fast or drink some vegetable juice like you did the first uh, three to ten days. And also you want to incorporate cilantro, parsley, chia seeds, flax seeds, aloe vera, and sea vegetables. And that you can go five uh, at least days. You can do longer if you want to. It's a great program. The Duke Diet is, uh, is the best diet that I have ever found to reverse cardiovascular disease. To show you how, how healthy a diet it is, at Duke, they will leave their patients on that diet for one year if they have significant cardiovascular disease. And all those patients are eating is for breakfast is that brown rice and the fruit, and then the brown rice and the salad. That's what they're eating, just those there. Now, let me give you some suggestions on the brown rice. Depending on how long you eat it, at Duke, you just eat the brown rice. You don't put anything else in it. But if you want to put, I found if you want to, you know, while you're making your brown rice, you want to put some, some, um, some garlic or some onions or some herbal seasonings, that's fine. Or if you want to cut up your, your uh, bananas, or if you want to make banana milk, write this down. Banana milk. I learned this from a good friend of mine, Dr. Agatha Thrash, back in 1974. It's a tremendous uh, milk. It's one ripe banana with spots on it, three ounces of water, and a dash of vanilla extract. Blend it up and you've got banana milk. And you can pour that over your, your rice and make kind of a rice pudding. If you want a banana milkshake, no problem. You can have a banana milkshake. Here's what it is. Two ripe bananas. That's the type that have the spots on it. Three ounces of water. Five ice cubes. And a dash of vanilla extract. Blend it up. Not to where it's plum foamy, but blend it up to it's Pretty good, you can blend it too long, but it's delicious and that it's totally healthy and you just made you a milkshake that you can have for breakfast or for supper. You wanna also add exercise, the outdoors and fresh air and sunshine, and then you also wanna make sure you have plenty of water. So, in this program, in the first Step one, step two, and step three, we had three different diet plans. The first one was the vegetable juice. That's 16 ounces of vegetable juice each meal, breakfast, dinner, supper. The second one is where you do the Simply Raw, and that's raw fruit for breakfast, raw uh, vegetables for dinner, and for supper, either fast or you can drink a vegetable juice. And then is the Duke diet the brown rice and the fruit, and the brown rice and the salad, and the juice for the supper. Now, why do I encourage juice for supper instead of going on and doing the brown rice and another serving fruit for supper? If you want to lose weight, and many folks do, when you eat breakfast, it, you, it, it increases your metabolism, you burn calories. When you eat dinner, it increases metabolism, and you burn calories. But Dr. Koop found at three o'clock in the afternoon, your metabolism is shut off. And what you eat from there on, you actually are gonna hang on to. You're gonna hang on to those calories and it's gonna make it much more difficult. It's gonna slow down your process of losing weight. Plus, if you eat that large supper, uh, it, or even the Duke diet for supper, it has a propensity to putrefy and ferment. So you, it'd be better for you just to either fast, 
which you'll progress even faster, or drink the vegetable juice, which is going to be in your blood within how long? 15 uh, minutes. Now you have an option. You can just juice during this program. You can just eat raw. You can just uh, do the Duke diet. Uh, or you can go back and forth. I encourage people to systematically do the juice, the Simply Raw, and then the Duke. But I'll put another option out there for you. Some folks just, folks just have a tough time, you know, just really sitting down and doing that. I want you to be successful. And so there's another option. Henry Ford said you can have any color of car you want as long as it's black. Well, I'll tell you, you can have anything you want to eat as long as it's right there on the board. Vegetable juice, simply raw, or the Duke diet. Now, it is true that the Duke diet, the more you do the Duke diet, the slower it is. So how does that work? So you get up in the morning and you say, what would I like for breakfast? Hmm, I think I'd like to eat raw fruit, okay? And then what would I like for dinner? I think I'd like... Uh, I think I'd like to do the Duke diet. So I think I'm going to have uh, brown rice and a salad. And what am I going to have for supper? I think I'll do some vegetable juice. And I encourage you to always put the vegetable juice for supper because you'll go a whole lot faster if you'll do that. Now as we look at step four, that is a diet that was put together, uh, Cornell University, Cambridge University, and two other universities looked at what is the healthiest diet in the world to eat. They looked at it for over 20 years. And they finally came up with a diet that if you eat this, you'll die quicker, or if you eat that, you'll live longer. What's cool is that diet is the diet that's in Genesis that God gave Adam and Eve when they left the garden. And that is a whole food, plant-based diet. And so what do you do? on step four. Step four is enjoy the benefits of the most healthy diet for the rest of your life. Now, you need to look at this as not just a diet, but a lifestyle. Now, people ask me, what's my diet? Well, I'm on a diet. I eat a whole food plant-based diet. Now, I'm not a vegan because I've got a leather belt and vegans don't wear leather. So, you want a whole food, plant-based diet, and not just a plant-based diet, because Fruit Loops are a plant-based diet. Did you know that? And Fruit Loops are not healthy, because it's refined sugar, it's refined grains. So you want a whole food, plant-based diet. And that is, your, that is your maintenance diet, that you're gonna live, according to Cornell and, and Cambridge, you're gonna live 15 years longer, 15 years longer than the person, your next door neighbor, the guy sitting next to you at work who's just eating that standard worldly diet. So what do you do? It's the New Start lifestyle. New Start because we're talking about, we'll, we'll go through those in a few minutes, but it's a lifestyle. Again, you're going to bed by nine o'clock. You're eating, drinking, you're still going to do each morning that two glasses of warm lemon water first thing in the morning. You're still going to detox your mind with at least 30 minutes of time with God in scriptures and in prayer. But then there's that whole food plant-based diet. Now I'd like to take a little break and go back to the kitchen. Now we're in this Old Mountain Remedy seminar and we, you watched us in the kitchen, in kitchen medicine. We're going to go back to the kitchen, and we're going to explain physiologically what's going on in the digestive process and why you need this whole food plant-based diet. We'll see you back in a moment. Welcome back to the Kitchen Medicine Cabinet. Does it really matter what we eat? Does it really matter what we drink? Well, let's take a look. Let's say that I went and I took, and this is sugar, and I took and put sugar in this glass. I'm going to put 15 and a half teaspoons. Now I normally do this with children and their parents are sitting out in the audience. And so I'll have a child take this and they will count out 15 and a half teaspoons. So this is two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, 
9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, and a half. So I'll ask you mothers out there, is this okay? 15 and a half, nearly 16 teaspoons for your child to go and just eat. Absolutely not. Why? Well, it's going to blow their immune system. They're going to go crazy. They're going to bounce off the walls. It's going to rot their teeth. So no, I probably would not allow my child to eat 15 and a half teaspoons of sugar. But wait a minute. Would you allow your child to drink a glass of water? Nice, pure water. Is it okay, Mom? Grandmother, is it okay? Sure, we can do that. But what if we do this? We're going to stir this up. What now, Mom? Would it be okay for Junior to drink this? Or sissy to drink this? It's water. But it's got 15 and a half teaspoons of sugar. What do you say? Well, what we don't realize many times is there is as much sugar in this as there is a 20 ounce Dr. Pepper. Now, 20 ounces is nothing today. Kids are drinking multiple of these. Sometimes they're drinking a 48 ounce, a 36 ounce. This right here will blow your child's immune system for the uh, about 73%. Your child's immune system is going to be blown about 73% for the next four hours. No way, would you say? Well, let's take a look. Let's look at the anatomy, some physiology of digestion. When we eat our food, it goes into the mouth where we chew it and we, uh, we break it off with our teeth, we chew it up, we mix the saliva with it, and as we swallow it, it goes down the esophagus into the stomach and breaks it down further. Then from there, it goes into the duodenum, into the small intestines. It breaks it down more there with the pancreatic enzymes, and then it's absorbed into the villi. They look like shag carpet. Remember shag carpet mom and dad and grandma? And it's got a little vein that runs on the outside. In the middle, it's got a lymphatic system going through the middle and it sucks it up. So whatever goes through our duodenum in the small intestine that's broke down small enough, it's the villi suck it up. It's kind of like vacuum cleaners. And whatever's a micronutrient, not a macro, but a micronutrient, it soaks it up and that's how quickly it gets it into the blood because the blood's right there on the edge of that villi. Well, let's look at this juicer. We've got the mouth, we've got the throat. Now, I don't have a stomach in here, maybe in this area. We got teeth down here, but whatever comes out of this right here, on this side here, the juice is what's going to be soaked up into the blood like it'd be going into the villi there. And then whatever comes out here would be the fiber that goes out the waste. So let's take a look. You can see it starting to come. Got a little loose stool there at first. Here it comes. Now we've got some nice fiber coming out, just like it's supposed to do. Let's put some celery here. Still got some good fiber coming out. some great juice there. But what about a little, little kale? Now this is packed full of nutrients. Super, super packed.
let's put a little more carrot. And again, got some green coming out. See where it's coming out? You got your green juice coming out. That's what's going into the blood. Whatever goes into this container here is, illustrates what is going into your blood. And what's happening here, this fiber that's just fiber, is what goes out is waste. Now let's look. Kind of looks like a rainbow, doesn't it? It's beautiful. Well, let's take and let's pour it into here. Delicious. So let's look at something else here. So again, going back, whatever goes in here is like our mouth, comes out, chews it up here. Whatever comes into this bowl is like what goes into our small intestines, what's absorbed into the blood. And this is the fiber that comes out. Let's try something else. Chocolate Eclair. Try a little of that Dr. Pepper. And let's try something else here. Let's try some Pringles. Try a little more eclair. Notice what's coming out here. It's a little different. Not a lot of good fiber coming out yet. A little more of our Dr. Pepper. Now, why aren't we getting a lot of fiber out of here? Well, because fiber try a little more Dr. Pepper. Fiber is in our whole foods, our fruits, nuts, grains, vegetables. But we don't find any fiber in meat. We don't find much fiber in refined foods as we're seeing right here. It's not coming out. But Mom, let's try this. Is it okay that Sally Drinks this, or eats this. Which would you rather choose? The juice from good vegetables and, or stuff from junk food. I encourage you, whatever you put in your mouth, or whatever Sally puts in her mouth, or Johnny puts in his mouth, that's gonna go into their blood. And whatever, whatever goes into the blood, 
is going to go into the brain. So if they eat a Twinkie, they're going to have Twinkie blood. If they have Twinkie blood, they're going to have a Twinkie brain. Mom, whatever you put on that table, whatever you decide to pull into for grabbing food on the way home, that is what goes into Junior's blood, into Sally's blood, and into their brain. Thank you all. Well, welcome back. What did you think? Isn't that amazing? So which do you want? Do you want the Twinkie blood and the Twinkie brain? Or as you saw there, do you want the, uh, the Frenchy Claire brain and the, um, the potato chip brain and the Dr. Pepper brain? Or do you want the brain that has that nice green juice that had kale and, and, um, and apple and carrots and, and celery? Your brain's going to work a whole lot better. And your, the rest of your body's going to work a whole lot better. And you're not going to be carrying the, that, that, that tire, which is full of Twinkies and, and French Eclairs and Dr. Pepper. So let's look at that whole food, plant-based diet. Whole food, plant-based diet. This comes from uh, Cornell University when I took plant-based nutrition from them. Animal proteins increase production of growth hormones. There has been more recent data in recent years and, uh, and growth hormones of certain kinds as they are elevated and become active, they tend to stimulate the growth of cancer. What did Cornell find that stimulates the growth of cancer? Animal proteins. They then found animal protein increases the rate at which cells divide, and that is fairly central to the carcinogenic process. Now what's central to the carcinogenic process? Animal proteins. We do not need animal protein, according to Cornell University, Dr. T. Colin Campbell. We do not need animal protein. We do not need to run the risk of doing that kind of thing. Here it's, it's uh, coming from the, uh, uh, the textbook, Nutritional, uh, Nutrition Fundamentals is the course, Nutrition Fundamentals. And that kind of thing is the diseases that we were discussing there. We do not need animal proteins. We do not need to run the risk of doing that kind of thing. Getting, getting those kind of diseases, eating those animal proteins, thus causing those diseases. If we just consume a plant-based diet that has adequate amounts of different kinds of foods, they will just naturally have enough protein. Now I have a friend that he used to call, if you eat the same old same old, he called it dog food. Well, we don't want to eat, just eat beans and taters and beans and taters. We want a wide variety of food. I encourage people as they sit down and they make their, their diet for breakfast, don't put the same thing every day. One of the problems that I've seen is people change and they start eating a whole food plant-based diet. They find, oh, this recipe's really good and they just eat it all the time, then they hate it. So you want a wide variety. And, and there's some great cookbooks that I'd encourage you to look at that can give you just a wide variety of taste to your tongue but it also gives you a wide variety of nutrition. My wife, when she was a young girl, her mother taught her to put f food on the plate that had different colors because it looked prettier. But also her mother had taken nutrition and her mother knew that different colors of foods meant different nutrients. So let's read that last sentence again. If we just consume a plant-based diet that has adequate amounts of different kinds of foods, they will just naturally have enough protein. And people tell me, oh, you can't get enough protein unless you eat your meat. That's not true. Cornell University, Cambridge University, and, three, and two other universities prove that wrong. The same course. There are no nutrients in animal-based foods that are not better obtained from plant-based foods. When we actually consume these nutrients, they are better obtained from plant-based foods in the context of the food than they are from animal-based foods. Antioxidants are only present in plant-based foods. Again, Cornell University, Nutrition Fundamentals. 
Now this is interesting, y'all. Listen to this really carefully. Casein represents about 87% of the protein in cow's milk. So of the protein that's in dairy, 87% of that protein is called casein. A reasonable shift in the level of dietary protein consumed turns cancer on and off even at relatively advanced stages of disease. And what Dr. Campbell did and his staff at Cornell University is they could literally turn on breast cancer, turn off breast cancer by giving the patients, by giving dairy, taking away dairy, giving dairy, taking away dairy. They could turn it on, turn it off, turn it on, turn it off. Amazing. Casein is the most significant chemical carcinogen ever discovered. Did you hear that? Now, what is casein? Casein is the ma major protein that's in milk, ice cream, dairy ice cream, cheese, milkshakes, sour cream, if it's a dairy product. So you can insert, instead of casein, you can insert milk products. Is the most significant chemical carcinogen ever discovered. In the minds of most people, that would be absolutely heretical. But we did it very carefully and from multiple different perspectives and published the results in the very best cancer research journals. Now, <clears throat> Cornell University is not that little community college down the road. And I'm not saying bad about community colleges, but they just don't have the, res the resources to have that super uh, department that studies nutrition. Cornell is a huge school that does really good research on nutrition, and that is what they found. Plant-based diets protect, now this is from the, the, uh, the course Diseases of Affluence. Plant-based diets protect against these diseases. Animal-based diets do not. Let's read that again. We're talking about diseases of affluence. That's a course. We studied all kinds of diseases. Plant-based diets protect against these diseases in that course. Animal-based diets do not protect the body from the diseases. Animal-based diets tend to promote these diseases Plant-based diets tend to protect against these diseases. It's a no-brainer. So, a whole food plant-based diet, how do you develop that program? So for breakfast, you can look at fruits and nuts and grains. <clears throat> and as we look at grains, I encourage you to do some research on gluten. We used to have wheat that had 16 chromosomes, and still parts of this world we do, and we've talked about this earlier in this series. But Monsanto has changed that from 16 chromosomes to 42 chromosomes. And so, as those changes, we're seeing a lot of health issues, as folks have super hybridized the, the wheat out there today. So for breakfast, a good breakfast, which breakfast should be the the main meal of the day. We should eat breakfast like a king, eat dinner like a queen, and if you do eat supper, eat it like a college student or a pauper. So breakfast, fruits, nuts, grains, gluten-free, dinner, that's the noon meal, vegetables, nuts, grains, gluten-free, supper, eat light, smoothies, juice, fruit. It's interesting. Growing up on a farm, generations of farmers Farmers are pretty smart folks. And, and when you have to grow your own food, there's a lot of time. When you have to put the food up, there's a lot of time. My grandparents, my great-grandparents, my parents found out that when you eat supper, you just don't sleep as good. You just don't feel as good. So why waste all that time that you had to go out there and, and hoe that garden and pick it and put it up and and fix it, and then you got to fix it for supper. you got to wash the dishes when you're finished. So we didn't have normal supper. In the summertime, our supper may be some watermelon. It might be some cantaloupe. It might be a little bit of popcorn. Or in the wintertime, we'd eat maybe some, some uh, soup. 
That, but that was it. We didn't eat a typical American supper until we left and went to the city and became city slickers and started eating supper like everybody else. And we felt different. So that's what a whole food plant-based diet consists of. I encourage y'all to get some good cookbooks that are uh, whole food plant-based. There's just all kinds of them out there, some great products, and take a look at those recipes. And I'm sure there's cooking schools possibly in your area. Go on YouTube and look at the, and, and just do cooking schools and learn these new recipes. Okay, vegetable juice. Whether for supper or just once a day before a meal, juicing is great nutrition each day. I encourage you, as you go to step four, and you go to that whole food plant-based diet to still drink vegetable juice every day. Drink a quart a day. Dr. Mercola encourages his patients and those around him to drink one quart of vegetable juice. You could do, a, say, a, a pint in the morning about 30 minutes before breakfast and then eat your breakfast and then drink a pint of it for supper. But vegetable juice is just so, so nutritious for us. One quart of vegetable juice a day, there's celery and cucumbers and add your dark green leafy vegetables, your, your, your kale and your dandelion and those guys, lemon, ginger, carrots, beets, all of those just pack full. And don't make the same juice all the time, make different ones, a variety, because they have different nutrients. We talked about this, uh, why wheat and gluten-free, some of the problems that we're seeing with the new wheat, weight gain, IBS, irritable bowel syndrome, thyroid problems, skin disorders, inflammation, increased LDL brain function uh, problems, it, it affects it. You then want to look at exercise. And exercise, once you've got to this point, you should be where you're exercising more than just five minutes a day. You want to crescendo your exercise. You know, don't just go wide open at first. You want to crescendo, start small and, and work up. But you want, you know, at a minimum of 30 minutes a day, but better yet, an hour each day. It's interesting. A couple years ago, the World Health Organization asked every physician in the world, every physician in the world to prescribe a new medication, to prescribe this medication to every person every patient in the world. World Health Organization asked the Centers for Disease and Control and Pre Prevention, CDC, to have every American physician to prescribe this new medication. And they said, if we will utilize this new medication worldwide, we'll save four million people a year. But they had to use it at least five days a week guess what that new medication was? 30 minutes of exercise. Isn't that interesting? Exercising outdoors in the fresh air and sunshine is the best exercise if weather permitting. It provides the following benefits. Fresh air for your lungs and, it, and eventually every cell in your body. See, when we breathe, the air, that fresh air goes into our lungs, our blood picks it up there in the villi, and it's carried to every cell in our body. And if we don't have good oxygenated uh, lungs, then we're not gonna have good oxygenated blood, and we're not gonna have good oxygenated cells, and the cells just don't run well. Have you ever had a, an engine that, that the, you know, you, you, you've got those little controls on a, on a small engine, and you adjust the air and you adjust the fuel. When we go into a certain area, let's say it's a house fire, and we're, we put the house fire out, but we've got to go in there and do overhaul, and I ask my guys to rip a wall out with the chainsaw, there's sometimes that chainsaw does not run well. Because as we crank it up outside, put the brake on, and, and we then go inside, and we're trying to run it, take it out, and we. Tr it, it goes out, it quits running because it doesn't have enough oxygen in there. Well, our body's the same way. For our, your bodies to run effectively, you've got to tune it to where you have good oxygen in. To do that, 
outside air, and exercise increases that also. Incre also, exercise outside increases your vitamin D level. If you're wearing sunglasses, then it's not going to increase the serotonin. So part of that time, you need to have the sunglasses off so that the ultraviol ultraviolet rays can come through the iris of the eye, stimulate the pineal gland to convert the tryptophan to the serotonin. And so you can't, if you're outside all the time, that's your line of work, you may want sunglasses part, a good bit of the day to protect your eyes, but not the whole time you're outside. You want to pick an exercise that makes you feel good. Um, it increases your endorphins. It strengthens your heart. It strengthens your muscles. Exercise and strengthens your bones. It lowers your, your uh, rise in, in uh, type 2 diabetes if you have a propensity there. It lowers your blood pressure. It raises the HDL, which lowers the cholesterol. It relieves stress and anxiety and depression. It increases overall energy. It helps maintain an ideal body weight. It improves circulation. It improves metabolism. Also, it, uh, it helps with bone density. <clears throat> if you have a weight-bearing exercise, that will in help with bone density. A rebander is the best thing I have found for that, a little mini trampling. Excellent way. That's what NASA uses when the astronauts come back from space. They're prone to uh, bone density loss because they've been in weightlessness. So NASA, who can afford any, basically anything to put those astronauts on, they use a, a mini trampoline or a rebounder to have them jump on it, and that increases bone density. <clears throat> what kind of exercise do I, uh, do I do? Not everyone can jog or participate in an Ironman, but most everybody can walk or swim, even if it's just a little bit. Rebounding, if possible, is another very good exercise. Walking in nature is also very, very beneficial. When you walk in nature versus walking downtown Chicago, there's a whole, just safety's an issue. Pollution's another issue. There's a whole difference in listening to cars honking and sirens blowing versus walking out and then breathing in the fresh air coming off of the trees enjoying watching the squirrels run around and the, and the birds fly around. One day I was walking and as I was walking I saw this um, this large uh, woodpecker. Um, I don't remember the name of him. Uh, a pileated woodpecker. And I spooked him and he took off from where he was there and I also when I spooked him we spooked a, a, um, another bird. It's a mockingbird. And as they both took off, they had the same landing zone target. And as they were coming in, they crashed. They didn't see each other coming. Interesting. You know, you see things like that in nature. You, you can see the deer. You can see whatever. Walking in nature is tremendously good for the fresh air, the exercise, the sunshine, but it's also very good for the mind. How much exercise do I need? <clears throat> you want to start with what you can do and increase as you can. A good goal would be 30 minutes to an hour a day, but you want to, to build with that. I remember there was a fellow one time, he'd just gotten a, a, a quadruple bypass, and he said, the doctors wanted me to walk around the block. He lived in a metropolitan area, and he, and he says, the doc wants me to walk around the block, but I can't do it. I said, you can. He said, how? I said, can you walk from your, your chair in your living room out to your mailbox? He says, I can do that. And then a couple days later, I asked him, I said, can you walk twice a day? I can do that. Okay, can you walk from the mailbox to the neighbor's mailbox, which was just the next house over on, on the block, and back? He says, I can do that. And we kept working over a month's time to where he was adding a mailbox, adding, adding a mailbox as he got around and his wife would drive in their car to make sure he didn't have any acute episodes. And by the end of the month, he could walk halfway around the block and walk back. Well, instead of walking back, he just went on around the block. And in one month, he was able to do what the cardiologist had asked him to do. And so start slow and build. 
You want, you want to mix cardio and strength building. And the next is water. We want to make sure you're drinking plenty of water. Um, again, if you're less than 128 pounds, you need the ha half a gallon, which is four water bottles or four liters. Um, if you're over 128 pounds, it's your body weight divided by two. Now, when you're exercising, you need even more water. Water's the best beverage. No sugar, no caffeine, no alcohol, no preservatives. Uh, our brain should be 85% water and our blood should be 80% water. So we need adequate water. And folks say, I just can't think good. This man came to, came to me one day and he says, I think I'm getting Alzheimer's. He was 45 years old. And if a person tells me they think they're getting Alzheimer's, they probably don't have it from my experience. And I said, well, sir, what do you, what's going on? He says, well, I work in the building industry. I'm a carpenter. He says, but I just can't remember. He says, I just can't remember things. And I asked him, I said, how much water do you drink? He says, I don't, do, I don't drink water. So I encouraged this ratio that I just told you, body weight divided by two, but then we added an extra two quarts because he worked outside. He came back two months later and he said, I haven't thought this well since I was in my 20s. All he was was dehydrated and he thought he had Alzheimer's. Very, very important. Sunshine, the darker the pigment of your skin, the longer the conversion from cholesterol to vitamin D. So you'll need even more time outside. Sunglasses, we talked about that. They can uh, prevent the light from coming in. You want to protect the body from getting sunburnt. Clothing's a good way to do that. Be careful of sunscreens. There's some that are not very healthy for you. And drink adequate amount of water when out in the sun. This last week, we had a wildland fire. It ended up being a thousand something acres in, in Tennessee. And there's a lot of fires going on. And when we go, my son and I go fight fires with the United States Forest Service, they require us to drink a gallon of water every hour and a half. And so when you're exerting yourself, you need to drink extra water. <clears throat> Sunshine enhances the immune system. It alleviates pain from swollen arthritic joints. It relieves certain symptoms of PMS. It lowers blood cholesterol levels. Well, how does that do that? Well, it lowers blood cholesterol because when you are in the sunshine, you convert cholesterol into vitamin D. So it's lowering cholesterol. But vitamin D is required to make HDL, the good cholesterol, and the good cholesterol gets rid of the bad cholesterol, and so that lowers total cholesterol. So two ways sunshine is going to, is to, lower, is going to lower your cholesterol. Temperance, making the right choices, moderation in the good things, total abstinence in the bad things. You want to disregard things like tobacco, alcohol, harmful uh, uh, food additives. Um, so when you go to the store, you want to make sure that you're looking at labels. Even, though, uh, even the choices in our reading, the conversations, and what we watch has a significant impact on, functionings, on the functioning of our bodies. You want pure fresh air. Pure fresh air has a significant impact on our brains and on every living cell in the body. On the other hand, living in communities who have high pollution, the pollution has a significant negative impact on the body. You want to practice diaphragmic breathing. You want to practice breathing with your stomach. You want good breaths, not breathing like a little chihuahua where you're just breathing a little up here. You want to sit and stand erect to benefit the maximum air intake from our breathing. Rest. The hours of rest before midnight are worth twice the hours after midnight. In order to get a good full cleaning, benefits of the glymphatic system, that's like the lymphatic system, but it's the, the lymphatic system in the brain, which is called the glymphatic system, you've got to be asleep by about 9 o'clock. And it only kicks on between 9 and midnight. That's only the time that it works. But to, for it to work, you have to be asleep. So if you want to clean your brain, clean the cells, detox your brain, flush your brain of those toxins, you got to be asleep between 9 and midnight. Rest allows your body to renew itself. Toxins are removed and enzymes are replenished throughout the whole body. 
It strengthens the body's immune system, increases healing in infections and injuries, increases brain function, aids in weight control. Significant, if you want to lose weight, you've got to be to bed early, and there's a number of reasons for that. And as we look at the New Start, the last one on New Start is trust in God, trust in divine power. True healing only comes from God. Yes, something may work, but it may not be of God. There's some weird stuff out there, y'all, and it may not be of God. Develop a personal relationship with God in Christ. Philippians, Philippians 4.13 tells us, I can do all things through Christ which strengthens me. Can you, can you make this plan work? Can you make a new lifestyle plan so that you can reverse your cardiovascular disease, so you can reverse your diabetes, so you can improve your overall health, so you can lose that weight? Absolutely. In a working relationship between you and Christ. So, nutrition, uh, the, we have plan one, vegetable juice, three to 10 days, uh, the Simply Raw, three to 10 days, the Duke diet, five days or more, and a whole food diet the rest of your life. That's plan one. I encourage plan one. That is the, that's the most effective. That's what works best. But if you say, Walt, I can't do it. Or if you kind of fall off, get back on. I've got two grandchildren that recently learned how to walk. The first time they fell down, I didn't say you can't walk no more. They got back up and walked again. They fell down again. They got back up. But there is a plan too, and this is one that I did because I didn't know about these others. But I did this one 17 years ago. I mentioned Mary Lou took away my, my M&M machine. Well, she also did this. I was not eating breakfast. I was not eating dinner. I didn't take time to eat dinner. I only ate supper. And I looked it. I was 200 and some pounds. And in three months, three months, I lost right at 50 pounds. And what we did is she fixed me a good breakfast and she says, you're not leaving the house till you have a good breakfast. And then she connived with my secretary. Well, first of all, she got rid of the m, &M machine. But she connived with my secretary and she says, I want you to call in Walt's tray from the dietary department and have it sent to the employee lounge every day. And then at meetings in the afternoons that he has with staff and department heads and whatever, tell him he can't eat any of that food and try to get him not even put food in there. And so my secretary did that. I would be out on the floor checking on patients, walking, making rounds, whatever, going around, checking on staff. and. I get to call on my radio. Walt, your tray's ready in the employee lounge. Okay. So I'd go and have to sit down and eat, take time and eat that dinner. Then nothing all afternoon. I couldn't eat either. Couldn't eat during the morning. Couldn't eat during the afternoon. And then when I got home, there was no food. Nothing for three months. It was tough because I was used to eating then. I'd changed it. But remember when I was a child, we ate just the opposite. And then when we got moved to the city and became city slickers and we just flopped it, well, I got flopped back the other way. Does it hurt a little bit? Well, it's, it's different. Uh, it, it's a training of the mind. I was actually eating more calories because I was eating a full breakfast. I was eating a full dinner, more calories. But because I was eating it at the right time when the body's made to do it, I was losing weight. Because what you eat for supper, you don't burn those off effectively. So, Eat a good breakfast, eat a good dinner, and nothing after dinner. And then go to the whole food plant-based diet. S special needs, stress. You need rest, nutrition, exercise, water. B-complex, magnesium, lithium, orotate. In this series, Old Mountain Remedies, take a look at our stress seminar. Because stress is many times the trigger that causes folks to eat more, to eat between meals. You've got to get a control on stress. You can't get rid of it, but you want to manage it. And so watch that seminar. Hormones for women. We talked about hormones possibly being an issue. You want rest, good nutrition. We found that when we juice 
women, vegetable juice. It provides copious amounts of good nutrition that helps the body then produce the proper hormones. It's amazing. Exercise, water, wild yam cream. Uh, wild yam cream is something that you can transdermally put on uh, twice a day. It comes from yams or sweet taters. And it, uh, it actually will help you stabilize progesterone and it will help you then stabilize estrogen. It works very, very well. Then nettle tea. Uh, you want to take about a half, a quarter to a half a cup of nettle tea, uh, a nettle herb, and put it in a quart of water, make a tea, and, and let it sit overnight or at least 30 minutes, and then drink that throughout the day. Works very well. Flaxseed. You want uh, three tablespoons of freshly ground flaxseed. Eat it within 15 minutes of grinding it because flaxseed oxidizes very rapidly. You don't want to buy, you do not want to buy flaxseed that's pre-ground. And so you need three tablespoons in the morning, three tablespoons at night. Very, very good for helping you to uh, uh, address hormones. Now you say, but you said don't eat supper. You, you just put it in a glass of water, stir it up and drink it if you're not eating any food. And Vitex, if that's not working, add a little Vitex and that can help. Hormones for men. Here's what causes problems with men's hormones. Um, I, you want rest. Guys aren't sleeping. Rest. Well, if you're sleep deprived, it lowers testosterone. Uh, if you're not drinking adequate nutrition, it can affect testosterone. Juicing will help there also. Exercise, water, sarsaparilla is a great herb to help build the, um, the testosterone. If you drink alcohol, stop alcohol because drinking alcohol will lower testosterone. The other thing that I didn't put on here, I didn't put the alcohol. Another thing that we found will lower uh, testosterone is visceral fat. That's belly fat. Now, what happens is, is when you're eating this new wheat, this 42 chromosome wheat, it, in, it causes visceral fat. And that visceral fat then lowers estradiol. And when you lower the estradiol, that can affect your, your uh, testosterone. So, we now need to implement. We have a mission, we assessed, we made a plan, now we've got to implement it. We've made this plan, it's a very systematic plan, we've got all the bugs worked out. You want to do this ahead of time. If you were going to go to New York City, or let's say you were going to go to Paris, and there's this, there's this uh, museum there that has this real fancy diamond that's worth millions of dollars, are you just going to walk in there and steal that diamond? No. You're going to study this. You might study it for a year. You're going to learn their, their uh, security system. You're going to learn the movement of, of guards inside. You're going to learn the movement of, of law enforcement going around. You're going to develop backup plans. If this doesn't work, then you're going to do this and this. Now, I've never done this, y'all. But you're going to have a systematic plan to do that. So you have a partner. You've set a date. It's, uh, it's uh, time to implement your plan now. You want to stay strong. You want to set your plow, and you don't want to look back. What do I mean? Y'all that ever worked on a farm, you, you look across a field. You've got you to gotta put that first line in of you're going to plow. And you look plumb on the other side of that field, and you see that tree way down there. You got your tractor here ready. You set your plow and you take off. And you watch that tree way down there. My mission is to get to that tree all the way down on the end of that field. I don't look back to say, hmm, how am I doing? Is that a straight row? Or I don't look over here, hey guys, hey, look how my plow is. No. At first, you're just keeping your eye on your mission. You're looking straight down there and you're watching that tree as you go and you go and you go, and you go, until you get to the end. And that's what you need to do here. I remember one time working in corporate America in healthcare, <clears throat> we usually, the folks that would, would acquire other healthcare companies, well, it came to the time a bigger fish decided to gobble us up. And I had a boss come in who had some wisdom, and he said, don't pay attention to those folks 
that are about to gobble us up because you can't do a thing. Your job is, is here and take care of your program here. <clears throat> Make sure patient care stays good. Make sure your finances are good and you'll be okay. But if you take your eyes off of that and you start worrying about what they're doing on this acquisition that's about to happen, someone about to take over us, there's nothing you can do about that, but you'll lose sight on taking care of your own ship. Keep your eye on patient care. Keep, keep your eye on finances. So I took his advice. I just took care of our own location. The acquisition took place and they didn't bother me. Other administration, administrators who did not take his advice, who kept trying to look over here and look over there and see what was happening, well, because they weren't keeping track on their own ship, it got astray. And some of those administrators lost their jobs. And so I know that if you keep your eye on the mission, on that goal, through Christ, you can be successful. So, evaluate. You want to monitor your outcomes. What's your outcomes? What's my weight? If you're worried about losing weight or you want to lose weight. What's my glucose running? How have I changed my medications? What's my blood pressure running? Have I changed my medication? Do I feel better? You remember we, were, we documented how the pain is in my hand, how the pain is in my shoulder, how the pain is in my hip, how the pain is in my knees. What's the pain in my back? Zero to ten. Are those numbers getting better? Are you monitoring those numbers throughout this? Is your plan working? Do you feel better? Is it working? Does your stomach feel better? Is it working within your schedule? If it's not, you want to make necessary adjustments. If the money's a little you may say, I have a little more money. I can do it a little more aggressive. I can do this more in exercise. Make the adjustments. But you want to stay strong. And again, the key is, what? You got to trust God in His strength. Philippians 4.13, and we'll finish this. I can do all things through Christ, which strengthens me. Thank you all.